Well, good morning, everyone. If you'll turn your Bibles to Revelation 22, that's where we're going to begin our lesson this morning as we talk about reigning with Christ. <clears throat> hmm, this clicker is not working. Do we have another one in the back, if we can get that switched out? Uh, <clears throat> in Revelation 22, uh, and while we're working on that, I'll just say, uh, obviously, uh, this is not an ideal situation. As we've, as we've said before, sure wish we could see your bright and shining faces this morning. But, you know, even though there's only seven people here at the building this morning, uh, it still doesn't feel lonely. It feels like we know you guys are all tuned in, and so we are still kind of all in this together in some way, and I'm grateful for that. Okay, we've got a new clicker. I think I'll be grateful for this. We'll see. <laughs> Okay, I haven't tried it. I can't do it yet because I've got to, that's fine, I'll try it. It's all we've got, so if it doesn't work, then we'll resort to something else. Well, in Revelation 22, remember from our class Wednesday night, this passage is not just about heaven, but it's also about our life right now in the church. And in Revelation 22, verse 5, it says, There will no longer be any night. They will not have need of the light of a lamp nor the light of the sun, because the Lord God will illumine them, and they will reign forever and ever. You know, the most fundamental question in life is, why am I here? At an early age, we ask ourselves, what do I want to be when I grow up? That's a purpose question. We want to know what role we are supposed to play in society. And that question can be stressful because there are so many roles to play in this life and it's hard to pick a role that we feel like would help us reach our full potential as humans. My younger brother was scarred as a child when he was part of an elementary school play. And at the end of that play, the teacher went around asking all of the kids, what do you want to be when you grow up? And so they're going around and you know, firefighter, one kid says, and some said police officer, and one astronaut. And then when they got around to my brother, he said, window washer. And the entire auditorium erupted with laughter. <laughs> and my poor brother, he was so confused, he did not understand why everybody was laughing at him, what, what was so funny. Uh, but I think it's because... It's just not typically the role that people aspire to in order to reach their full potential in life. And I asked him why he gave that answer, and apparently he had just seen a documentary about those guys who are way high up on those dangling scaffolds washing the windows of skyscrapers. Now, you couldn't pay me enough money in the world to do that job, but I could see how a little kid looking at those window washers would think, man, that is an awesome job. That's an awesome role to play. But what if one of the kids stepped forward and said, I want to be a king? Well, I think he'd get laughed at too, but just for the opposite reason. In his case, it wouldn't be that he wasn't aiming high enough, like the window washer answer perhaps, it's that people would think he's aiming too high, unrealistically high. Because, I mean, first of all, we live in America. This is a democracy. There are no kings and queens. But second of all, being a king or queen would give you way too much power and way too much responsibility. And history shows us people don't typically handle the power and responsibility of kingship, kingship well. So this morning, I want to introduce you to a paradigm shift in your thinking. By telling you that no matter what you decided to be when you grew up, whether that is an accountant or a firefighter or a secretary or a stay-at-home mom or, yes, even a window washer, if you are a man in Christ, you are a king. And if you are a woman in Christ, you are a queen. As a child of God... You were destined to reign in life with Christ. And that means your role in this world is to rule in this world on God's behalf. Now, I recognize that's a pretty radical claim. And this is a pretty big paradigm shift. 
So let's bring God's word into this by starting with the theology of kingship in Scripture. Would you turn back with me to Genesis chapter 1? Genesis chapter 1. We've already seen how the Bible ends in Revelation 22 with us reigning as kings and queens in God's presence. But it's important to know the Bible starts the same way. In fact, in Genesis 1, when God created the world, he was acting with the authority of a king who gives commands and then things get done. In fact, Psalm 33 describes God's creation in Genesis this way. In Psalm 33, 6 and 9, by the word of the Lord, the heavens were made and by the breath of his mouth, all their hosts, for he spoke and it was done. He commanded, and it stood fast. So when God said, let there be light, light came in and said, yes, my king, I will do that. (laughs) And then light appeared. And you could go down the list. Everything God commanded in this chapter was a command from the authority and by the authority of a king. And notice three characteristics of God's rule as king in Genesis. First of all, he ruled by bringing order Out of chaos. In Genesis 1, 1 and 2, it says, In the beginning God created the heavens and the earth. The earth was formless and void, and darkness was over the surface of the deep, and the Spirit of God was moving over the surface of the waters. So the earth here was formless and void. It was disordered. And in fact, it was covered by the sea, which uh, again in the ancient world, the sea was a metaphor for chaos. I don't want to say a metaphor because the sea is a real, it was a real sea. Uh, But when people thought of the sea, they thought of chaos and disorder and death. Yet God here brings order from the chaos and the disorder. Secondly, he ruled by bringing life out of death. As you trace the creation account, you see God creating everything necessary for life to flourish on the earth. So look in chapter 1, verses 11 and 12. God said, let the earth sprout vegetation, plants yielding seed and fruit trees on the earth, bearing fruit after their kind with seed in them. And it was so. The earth brought forth vegetation, plants yielding seed after their kind, and trees bearing fruit with seed in them after their kind. And God saw that it was good. Here, it's like God is is planting a garden. He's planting a garden throughout the entire earth to sustain life. And then when he creates humans, the crown of his creation in chapter 2 and verse 7, it says, Then the Lord God formed man of dust from the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life, and man became a living being. So when God acts as king, he brings life into lifeless things. He brings life into places where there was no life before. And thirdly, he ruled by blessing the world with goodness. In Genesis 1, God pronounces seven times that what he made was good. And herein lies a key point that you have to keep in mind If you want to understand the theology of kingship in Scripture, God, as king of the cosmos, is portraying himself in Genesis 1 and 2 as the one with the authority to determine what is good and what is not good. When he saw his creation, he said, this is Good, And in fact, a couple times he said, this is very good. But then, of course, when he saw that Adam was alone, he said, that's not good. And not only does God have the, have the wisdom, the royal kingly wisdom to determine what's good and what's not good, he actively then seeks to bless the world and bless humanity with what is good. So, for instance, when he sees that Adam is alone and he says that's not good, what does he do? He immediately creates Eve so that he can bless Adam with true goodness. Now, with that picture in mind about how God rules as the ultimate king, let's go to Genesis 1, 26 to 28. God said, let us make man in our image according to our likeness and let them rule over the fish of the sea and over the birds of the sky 
and over the cattle and over all the earth and over every creeping thing that creeps on the earth. God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him male and female. He created them. God blessed them and God said to them, be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth and subdue it and rule over the fish of the sea and over the birds of the sky and over every living thing that moves on the earth. I just want us to appreciate how astounding uh, this is. When God makes us in his image, there's probably several things that that means and long discussions have been had about that. But part of that means to rule as kings and queens over creation on his behalf. Now, here's the thing. In the ancient world, the only people who were viewed as images of the gods ruling on the gods' behalf were literal kings and queens sitting on literal thrones over, over their kingdoms. But here, God says this is every human, not just the special people. You know, typically, if you were going to be ruling in the image of God, well, you had to be one of the special people in society. But Genesis 1 sets itself apart from the entire culture around them by saying, actually, it's every human being because we're all made in God's image. That means we are all kings and queens destined to rule in this world from the richest to the poorest, the shortest to the tallest, the youngest to the oldest. The psalmist, in fact, in Psalm 8, he marvels at God and he says, how in the world can you even think of man? How do you, why do you care for us? And he describes it, one of the things he marvels at is how God has made human beings to rule over the works of his hands and put all things under his feet. That is a tremendously high calling, a tremendous privilege, and a tremendous responsibility because to be made in God's image means our rulership as humans must reflect God's rulership. How? Well, by living our lives in such a way that brings order out of chaos in the world, life out of death, and by blessing this world with goodness and righteousness. Think about it. Adam and Eve were to cultivate the garden. And number one, that's keeping order, isn't it? Because subduing the ground, subduing the garden means they have to impose their will upon the dirt. If you don't do that, if you don't actively subdue and actively rule over that garden to keep order, chaos will result. There'll be weeds and you know all kinds of other uh, terrible things that happen when you neglect a garden. So number one, they had to keep order there. Number two, they planted new life there. They were cultivating life in that garden. And not only that, but God told them, Adam and Eve, I want you to, you know, as a married couple, to be fruitful and multiply and to fill the entire earth with life. And three, well, they were supposed to fill the garden and the earth with goodness by obeying God's righteousness, by obeying his good commands and filling the earth with people who obey God too. But you know and I know, that's not how Adam and Eve ruled in the garden, was it? Genesis 3, turn there. After God told them not to eat from the tree of knowledge of good and evil, chapter 3, verses 4 through 6, the serpent comes along and says to the woman, you surely will not die. For God knows that in the day you eat from it, your eyes will be open and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. And when the woman saw that the tree was good for food and that it was a delight to the eyes and that the tree was desirable to make one wise, she took from its fruit and ate and she gave also to her husband with her and he ate. Adam and Eve, as rulers on God's behalf, we're su supposed to trust in God's authority 
to determine what was good and not good, what was good and evil. But Satan convinced them they could be kings and queens of their own without God's help. In fact, if they eat from this tree, Satan says, you know, you'll be like God with the, with the power to determine what's good and what's evil for yourselves instead of relying on God because you can't trust God to tell you what's good. And when they sinned, instead of ruling in this world like they were supposed to, the world began to rule over them. Instead of subduing the snake in the garden, the snake subdued them. And the world from then on would bring chaos and thorns and thistles, and it would actually become tremendously difficult to rule in this world the way God does. For instance, there would be so much chaos in the world that God says the only way you can bring order into this world is by the sweat of your brow. You're going to have to toil and work hard because chaos is going to reign and it's going to be difficult to, bring a bring, to be a bringer of order. Not only that, they brought death into the world because of their sin. So much so that they created a world in which bringing life into the world is so painful, women scream for hours just to make it possible. And instead of filling the earth with the blessing of goodness, they did evil and filled the earth with a curse. And sadly, all of humanity, including you and I, after Adam and Eve, at some point in our lives, used our powerful position for our own selfish gain. And we've all said, you know what? I can determine good and evil for myself. I don't really need God's help to tell me what's good. In fact, I can build my own kingdom that's just as good and just as right. And the curse of sin was perpetuated. But the wonderful news is God became flesh. And when Jesus arrived, Jesus showed us what it looks like for human beings to actually reflect the image of God. He showed us what it looks like to rule properly in this world on God's behalf. And just like God in Genesis 1, Jesus in John 1 came to bring order out of chaos and life out of death and to fill the earth with the blessing of goodness and righteousness. And one of the beautiful results is that those who obey King Jesus by faith and are baptized into him, our sins are washed away. We're a new creation where God is starting over with us. And you know what? He's restoring his image within us that we had distorted because of our sin, where we are now ruling in this world on God's behalf like we were supposed to from the very start. And so you have verses in the New Testament like this. Romans 5, 17. If by the transgression of the one, death reigned through the one, that's Adam, much more those who receive the gift, or excuse me, the abundance of grace and of the gift of righteousness will reign in life through the one, Jesus Christ. Rather than having death in the curse of this world ruling over us, now sin and death are under our feet in Jesus, and we are ruling and reigning in this world. Paul says in Ephesians 2, 5 and 6, Even when we were dead in our transgressions, God made us alive together with Christ. By grace you've been saved and raised us up with him and seated us with him in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus the seats there are thrones. We're pictured here as current co-rulers with God in this world. We read already the, from the end of Revelation 22, but if we go back a little earlier in Revelation 5, as the Lamb is being praised in heaven, this is what's said to the Lamb, you have made them to be a kingdom and priests to our God, and they will reign upon the earth. Your role in this world is to rule in this world on God's behalf. I am grateful to Tim Mackey at the Bible Project for helping me to sharpen my thoughts on this subject. 
And I want to emphasize the magnitude of what this means by contrasting it with some of the ways that we typically perceive our role here on earth as Christians. Here are some typical pictures. Picture one, you know, God merely tolerates our existence, and, you know, if we don't upset him too much, we'll go to heaven. God doesn't merely tolerate us. He invites us to partner with him in covenant relationship to rule in this world on his behalf. That is not toleration. That's empowerment. That's actually entrusting us with a divine stewardship and blessing us with an amazing privilege and responsibility. Picture number two, you know, if I want to do important work for God, I need to be a preacher. No, Adam and Eve were ruling on God's behalf simply by cultivating a garden being fruitful and multiplying in their marriage and teaching their kids about God. The truth is, God can use any position that we have in this life as a position from which we can be co-ruler with Him. Even as a window washer, we can bring order and life and goodness in this world. You know, dirty windows, that's chaotic. That's disordered. And a window washer can bring order to that. Dirty windows on a car actually bring death. So you clean a car window, you're, you're bringing life and preserving life in this world. And it's not good psychologically for people to look at gross windows all day. Uh, so again, even in that line of work, you're actually partnering with God to subdue chaos and to subdue death and to bring goodness into this world. And here's the most important application of that. If you leave an invitation to a Bible study on someone's window, now you're really partnering with God in the most important way because now you're bringing spiritual order and you're trying to bring spiritual life and spiritual righteousness to this world that's only possible in Jesus Christ. As Christians, evangelism is really about ruling on God's behalf by creating a whole new world in Christ, by loving our neighbor, by loving God, and by living and teaching the gospel. And you can do that whether you're a full-time preacher or not. Picture number three is that we watch God do all the work, and then you know, we, we praise Him and we give Him glory for it, but then we just kind of hunker down in the church building until He comes to destroy everything. But that's just not the picture at all. We should gather to worship God, and we should praise Him for His marvelous works, but we're not just passive bystanders in this world. God is not, think about this, God is not primarily a destroying God, because if when God steps in to destroy something, that means it's just hopelessly wicked, and there's just, you know, no, uh, no hope at all for any change. But we serve a God who would much rather renovate than destroy. And as Christians ruling on God's behalf, we can partner with Him to help renovate the world and the lives of the wicked people around us, but it will require actively finding ways to bring order out of the chaos and life from death and finding ways to spread the goodness and righteousness of Jesus Christ throughout the world. Your role in this world is to rule in this world on God's behalf. Now, let's get really practical about what this means in our lives and how this should affect us. First of all, it means we're going to need to seek God's royal wisdom daily. Our tendency as humans in Scripture and all throughout history is to forget that we are supposed to be ruling on behalf of God, the true king. And we act like we are God, the true king. We saw that with Adam and Eve trying to become like God in the garden. We saw it in the kings of Israel and most of the kings of Judah, who instead of trusting in God's word to tell them what is good and what is uh, evil and trusting in his royal wisdom, they just ruled however they wanted. We saw it in Revelation with the Roman emperors acting like they were gods and expecting people to worship them as gods. We saw it in so many of the pagan rulers of the Old Testament, especially the king of Babylon. Isaiah 14 is a good example of this. You said, this is the king of Babylon, 
Um, you said this in your heart, I will ascend to heaven. I will raise my throne above the stars of God, and I will sit on the mount of assembly in the recesses of the north. I will ascend above the heights of the clouds. I will make myself like the Most High. All these kings thought they were God, that they had the power to determine good and evil for themselves without God's help. And now what I want us to do is contrast those kings with Solomon's attitude when he was first crowned. In 1 Kings, if you'll turn there with me, to 1 Kings chapter 3. You know, at the start of Solomon's reign, to me this is just one of the most amazing passages, because God writes Solomon a blank check. Maybe you can think of it as God in genie-like fashion almost says to Solomon, I will grant you whatever you wish. You just tell me anything in this entire world that you want, and I'll give it to you. And I, you know, it's a challenge for me to think, boy, if God, if God posed that question to me, what would I ask for? And, you know, of course, most kings in that situation would say, well, man, I just want to be, you know, the richest man around. I want the most money. You know, I want uh, victory over all of my enemies. I want long life. But watch what Solomon says to God here and asks for in verse 7. Now, O Lord my God, you have made your servant king in place of my father David, yet I am but a little child. I do not know how to go out or come in. Uh, that phrase actually, by the way, going out and coming in is, is a phrase that's repeated in the Old Testament. It, it's about leadership. I don't, I don't know how to be a good leader, he's saying. Verse 8, your servant is in the midst of your people, which you have chosen, a great people who are too many to be numbered or counted. So give your servant an understanding heart to judge your people, to discern between good and evil. For who is able to judge this great people of yours? The Chronicles version he asks, who is able to rule this great people? As opposed to Adam and Eve, who ate from the forbidden tree, thinking they could discern good and evil for themselves without God, Solomon says, I need your wisdom, God. I need your discernment because I know nothing at all. I'm, a, I'm just a little child who, who needs guidance to rule this kingdom on your behalf. Solomon understood if he was going to be an accurate reflection of God's rule on the earth, he needed God's royal wisdom to do it. This is why it's so crucial to be every day in prayer to God and reading His Word, not just to create, you know, to finish some Bible reading plan or, or some other superficial reason, but, but because we have a tremendous responsibility to rule in this world on God's behalf. And the only way that we will do that successfully is by seeking God's royal wisdom. In fact, God's royal wisdom in Proverbs chapter 8 is personified. And she speaks. And here's what God's royal wisdom says in Proverbs 8, 15 to 17. By me, kings reign and rulers decree justice. By me, princes rule and nobles, all who judge rightly. I love those who love me and those who diligently seek me will find me. Kings and queens can only rule effectively by God's wisdom. So getting practical as a parent if I want to know how to rule my household well, and isn't it interesting? That's actually kind of the way that it's worded under the qualification of elders, uh, ruling one's household well. If I want to rule my household well, if I want to know how to bring order and life and goodness in the lives of my children, I need to be in prayer daily. I need to be seeking the wisdom in God's word. I need to be weekly coming uh, to the assembly to, to, to worship and remind ourselves. That's the power of when we come together to worship. We're reminding ourselves we're not the ultimate king. <laughs> we, we may have a position of rulership, but God is the king of kings. And he's the one 
who directs every aspect of our life. If I'm a student in school and I want to rule well over my schedule, I want to rule over my homework, I want to rule over the moral choices that I make, the friends that I choose, the royal advisors I put in place in my life. I need to be in prayer in God's word for royal wisdom. If I'm a business owner or I'm an employee of that business and I want to know how can I rule this business well? How can I rule my role in this business as an employee well to bring order and life and goodness? I need, I need the wisdom of God. And instead of thinking I'm the king and I'll call the shots, we need that humble attitude that Solomon had. Says, I, I mean, I'm just a little child. I've got this kingdom, Lord, that you've entrusted me with, the, the life around me, and I don't know what I am doing. I, I need you to tell me what to do. And of course, part of seeking daily royal wisdom is to focus on Jesus. Because Jesus showed us exactly what it means and what it looks like to rule in this world on God's behalf. And what it looks like is living a life of love for God and neighbor, taking a courageous stand for truth, a constant connection in prayer with the ultimate king, and sacrifice for the good and blessing of those around him. You know, the more we learn about Jesus, the more we meditate on King Jesus, the more fit we'll be as rulers in this world on God's behalf. Colossians 2 says this about Jesus, that in Christ are hidden all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. Secondly, this morning, it means that we're going to have to take responsibility for our choices. While being a king or queen on God's behalf is a wonderful pr privilege, it's also a huge responsibility, and that means our choices matter big time. Think about it. The higher your position in this world, the more your choices matter. I mean, if, if a chicken makes a foolish decision, that's not really that big of a deal. In fact, we, we may even get a chicken sandwich out of it. But if you're the president of the United States and you make a foolish decision, well, that, that's a big deal because you're affecting the entire country potentially. Yet even the president doesn't have all power in this country. There's a system of checks and balances. But imagine if you were actually a king or a queen in the ancient world. There is no system of checks and balances. What you say goes. And when you say something, that's going to have an immediate effect. Or when you choose to do something, it's going to have an immediate effect on your kingdom. And so there's that much more pressure then to not abuse your power. And essentially, this is why sin is so rampant in our world. It's because most human beings made in God's image as kings and queens are abusing their power and not realizing that with such power comes great responsibility to make good moral choices because those choices affect not only their own souls, but the souls of other people in their lives. Those are people that God wants us to bring order and life and goodness to. But when we abuse our power... It only brings chaos and death and wickedness to those around us. Look with me in Proverbs 1. Proverbs 1. I believe this, this is why Proverbs is framed the way it is. And I, I actually hope after this study this morning, after this sermon, we'll have a new and greater appreciation for Proverbs, this book. Because... It's wisdom from the king being passed down to his son. Because one day his son will be given the tremendous responsibility of ruling on God's behalf. And that's a responsibility all of us have. So look in verse 1, how it's framed. The Proverbs of Solomon, the son of David, king of Israel. Drop down to verse 8. Hear, my son, your father's instruction. And do not forsake your mother's teaching. Indeed, they are a graceful wreath to your head and ornaments about your neck. Really, Proverbs is wisdom from God, God, our King. And, and, and we are God's sons and daughters. And he tells us in this book that we must take responsibility for our thoughts and our choices because our choices matter. And really, that. 
The dichotomy is simple in Proverbs. The choice is simple. He says, choose wisdom, not folly. That's the big picture message of this book. Because when you choose folly, especially as a king, your life not only falls apart, but your whole kingdom that you've been entrusted with falls apart. And your rulership becomes the opposite of the reflection of God's rulership, and it ends up bringing death and disorder and wickedness instead. You know, sometimes uh, teenage Christians, this is what I love about Proverbs too. sometimes teenage Christians think, well, you know, I'll, I'll just kind of live however I, want, however I want right now, and then I'll get serious about my Christianity later. Proverbs says, no, you need to get serious right now because you are sons and daughters of the king, and every decision morally that you make matters. Proverbs 31, look there with me. I want to give you a practical tool here from this text. Proverbs 31. These are words of a king named Lemuel. Not 100% sure uh, who that was, but he, he was taught these things by his mother. And it says this in Proverbs 31, 4 and 5. It is not for kings, O Lemuel. It is not for kings to drink wine or for rulers to desire strong drink. For they will drink and forget what is decreed and pervert the rights of all the afflicted. So she's saying to him, look, getting drunk is not the behavior for kings because kings need to stay sharp. Kings need to stay focused. They've got a lot of responsibility to rule with justice and to make sure that the afflicted in their kingdom are taken care of. Here's how to make this verse practical for us this morning. If we are tempted to sin by making a foolish, sinful choice in life, a very empowering truth to acknowledge in that moment is that's not for kings. And if you are a woman or uh, a young lady, that's not for queens. So, you know, I really want to be lazy. Don't really want to do any work at all. You know, no chores. I don't want to mow the lawn and do laundry and you know, pay my bills and all that. You know, I just want to play video games and watch TV and just relax. That's not for kings. Parents, can you imagine? When your kids, I don't know, your kids, they probably won't be able to stand this after a while if you start doing this, but every time your kids grumble and, and complain, or every time your kids do something that's just clearly ungodly, and you tell them, hey, that's not for kings. That attitude's not for queens. I mean, to me, that, that's so empowering because, because what you're doing is you're telling them you're not, it's not just that you're being bad and you need to stop this bad behavior. It's you're not fulfilling your purpose. You're not living up to who you really are. Your actions and your words and what you're saying and doing, they don't match up with who you really are to the Lord. And you have so much potential to be a king or a queen in his kingdom. And sometimes our behavior, we just do things that aren't fit for kings, aren't fit for royalty at all. I kind of want to chew this person out, punch him in the face for what they did to me. That's, that's not for kings. You know, it's tempting. My coworkers, they want me to go out drinking with them. They want me to go out partying. I get it, but that's not for queens. I really want to fool around sexually with my boyfriend, even though we're not married. That's, that's not for queens. My role is to rule in this world on God's behalf. And that means that my choices matter big time right now. And I must stop making excuses and start taking responsibility for my actions. Uh, I was listening to a podcast recently by Andy Andrews about how to make goals stick. And he illustrated it this way. I like Andy because he, he always thinks out of the box and, and really brings things up in ways I'd never thought of before. But he illustrated it this way. He said, which goal do you think you are more likely to follow through on? This statement, I would really like to be a better husband this year. Or, I have a responsibility to be a better husband this year. It's the latter. And Andy's point in that podcast was, if you want to actually follow through on your goals, you have to take responsibility for those goals. And I wonder sometimes if that's what our Christianity is like. You know, I love the, class, the Bible class this morning, uh, but maybe we're just saying, you know, I would, love, 
I would love to kind of, you know, grow spiritually. I, I'd love to be more like Jesus. And I, I'd love to do some of those things we talked about in class. Instead of saying, actually, I have a responsibility to grow and be more like Jesus because my role is to rule in this world on God's behalf. And Jesus shows me and challenges me on how to do that better every single day. What do you need to take responsibility for this morning? What excuses do you need to stop making? Do you need to stop saying or doing or thinking? Because those things are just not fit for kings or queens. Finally this morning, don't let sin rule over you. You know, ruling on God's behalf by spreading order and life and goodness in this world through the gospel is really hard when sin is ruling over us because sin only brings disorder and death and dysfunction to the kingdom that we have been entrusted with. Genesis 4, 7, when Cain was tempted to kill Abel, God says to him, if you do well, will not your countenance be lifted up? And if you do not do well, sin is crouching at the door and its desire is for you, but you must master it. Interestingly, um, that word desire is the same word that was used back in Genesis 3.16 about Eve desiring her husband. And that desire was not about her passion toward her husband. It was about her desire to rule over her husband. But he says the husband is actually going to rule over you. So God's point here in using that same word is, Cain, sin's desire is to rule over you but you must rule over it. Psalm 19, 13, he says, Keep back your servant from, from presumptuous sins. Let them not rule over me. Then I will be blameless, and I shall be acquitted of great transgression. <clears throat> Psalm 119, 133, Establish my footsteps in your word, and do not let any iniquity have dominion over me. I hope you see the point here is not, well, you know, as kings and queens in, in this kingdom, like we're never going to sin again. No, it's about whether or not sin is ruling over us to where we're obeying sin as our king, Satan as our king, instead of obeying the king of kings, our God. Is there some sin that just dominates you and just makes you feel like a slave like you have absolutely no control over it. Maybe it's anger or jealousy that has consumed your life. Maybe it's pornography or food or alcohol addictions. Maybe it's our tongues and we just keep using wicked, evil words. Or maybe it's chronic worry and anxiety about our future or about COVID. Or maybe it's just constant feelings of hopelessness, or maybe it's laziness, whatever it is, I hope you see that none of these things are fit for kings and queens. And I wrote an article in the bulletin this morning to give us practical steps to stop allowing sin to rule over us, but instead to rule over sin. But I wonder if sometimes we let sin rule over us because we haven't really made this paradigm shift yet in our thinking. We don't realize who we are to God. We don't realize that we are rulers, and so we lack a sense of purpose, and we lack a sense of motivation as Christians. Our Christian life basically becomes, well, I better stay away from sin because, you know, God says it's bad, and I want to be good so I can go to heaven. That is such a shallow view of sin. That's a shallow view of our role in this world, and it's not empowering at all. We don't avoid sin just because it's bad. We avoid it because it keeps us from being rulers in the image of God who reflect His rule in this world. We conquer sin through Christ because it's part of our mission to rule, to rule as kings and queens on God's behalf. And if sin is ruling over us, we can't fulfill our role to bring order and life and goodness in this world. It becomes flipped around and we bring disorder, chaos, death, and wickedness instead. Again, I'll give you practical ways in that bulletin article to rule over sin, but I believe this paradigm shift alone. This is what I'm focused on this morning. I just want to change our thinking about our lives and about our roles. And I think that, that alone will go a long way to putting sin under our feet 
where it belongs so that we can stand on sin's neck in victory because we are being led by our God, the King of Kings. Your role in this world is to rule in this world on God's behalf. Well, if you're listening this morning and you are not a Christian yet, you need to know that God designed you to rule in this world. And truth be told, just the fact that you're a human being means you have this special privileged position of rulership. But if you're not a Christian, it means you're not ruling in God's image. It means you're, setting, you're trying to set up your own kingdom. You're saying, you've been saying to God, I can determine good and evil on my own, and I don't need you, God, to tell me how to, how to rule. I'll be my own ruler. And the result is that it only brings disorder and death and ultimately hell in the end. And so this morning, what you need and what we have all needed is for King Jesus to restore God's image in us, to forgive us of all of our sins, and to show all of us how to reach our full potential for God by becoming kings and queens who actually rule in God's image on his behalf and reach our full potential for the Lord. Jesus died on a cross to make this possible. And he's inviting you this morning to rule in God's image, whether you are a wealthy business person or a window washer. And for those of us Christians, if you're already a Christian, but you hardly ever spend time seeking God's royal wisdom, and you've not taken responsibility for your choices, and sin is ruling over you, The invitation for you this morning is to repent and to start reigning in life instead of letting life reign over you. If you need to respond in any way to Jesus' invitation today, I realize we're not at the building, but you can call me. You can call Dwayne. You can call our shepherds, and we will meet with you. We'll pray with you. We'll help you be where you need to be. Please consider this invitation seriously because your choices matter. Consider this while we sing this song of invitation.